So this is part five of the sharing that we have been carrying through, keeping the faith. And remember that this comes as we begin looking at uh, our faith as a church, as sons of God. What do we believe? We have taken time to look at the doctrine of Christ as one of the pillars of our faith. And uh, we looked at the divine side of Christ, the divinity of Christ. We also looked at the humanity of Christ. That's what we did last week. And today I want to conclude that part on uh, the doctrine of Christ by looking at or marrying the two marrying the two and uh, believe that the Lord will speak to us. It is clear from scriptures that Jesus Christ is a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. It's clear from the scriptures, right? Very important for us to understand that. This is very foundational, it's very fundamental and very basic. Jesus Christ is a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. Now, like we said last, last week, to emphasize the deity of Christ in no way diminishes his humanity. When we begin to emphasize on his divinity, we do not diminish his humanity. And to highlight his humanity does not in any way take anything from his deity. Okay? So none takes from the other none diminishes the other all right so the properties of each nature the divine nature and the humanity uh the the, the the properties of each nature retain their own integrity in their union in the singular person of the son of god jesus christ so every the humanity part of christ maintains its integrity the divinity part of christ maintains its integrity. Jesus maintains his integrity. Christ maintains his integrity. Alright? So Jesus would say is the human side. We talk of Jesus of Nazareth. We don't talk of Christ of Nazareth. Okay? So Jesus is the human side. And Christ is the divine side. The deity. So we have to take it as it is, beloved. You have to take it as it is and believe it to the fullest that the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Romans chapter 9, and I'm going to read a quick number of scriptures today. Romans chapter 9 verse 5. Romans 9 5. Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. So Christ came in the flesh. Who is over all? The eternally blessed God. So he came in the flesh and he is God. Amen. John chapter 20 verse 24. Very interesting scripture here. John 20 verse 24 through to 29. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Meaning he's visible, he's physical. We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's Thomas. And after eight days, you see, Thomas threatens, I will not believe, but Jesus is not in a hurry. Amen? Yeah. Your faith crisis does not dictate how the Lord responds. Sometimes we think that our crisis res you know, activates the Lord to respond. Sometimes we think that the Lord moves or responds to our crisis. No. He responds to our faith in Him. So the guy has a crisis. He says, unless I see and I touch and I put my hand in, I won't believe. Can you believe it? I will not believe and after eight days, remember it's a new beginning, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. This time around he is with the family. 
never isolate yourself from the family. Realize that Jesus did not reveal himself to Thomas alone, but he came to his family. Thomas was away. Now he is in the family and Jesus reveals himself. Bible says Jesus came the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said peace to you. Peace to you. Very interesting thing that to learn that the first thing that happens when you experience the reality of God's presence in your life is peace. We together is peace. That, that's, peace is a very good way of measuring whether God is involved in what you're doing or not. He said, peace to you. Right? Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hands here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Then Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Hallelujah. Very interesting. And, and, and I find that last part there uh, very, very powerful. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's a question of believing. But see what he saying. Thomas touches Jesus Christ. So he is touching the physical aspect of Jesus. But in touching the physical aspect of Jesus, he encounters the divine side of Jesus. And he breaks and says, my Lord and my God. Amen? He is not just a man. He is my Lord and my God. I have touched your human flesh. But beyond the human flesh, I have encountered God. I have encountered God. You know, Jesus came to actually speak loudly and model how God works throughout uh, the scriptures. God works in and through man. We're together. And God came to people through a man. The same picture here of Jesus is God coming in the person of Jesus is God coming through a man. Are we together? If you don't have the wisdom to touch and to see God in the man that God sends your way, you will keep going out for prayer and fasting, isolating yourself for days, and you come back uh, emaciated, tired, hungry, and weak without having encountered God. Oh, yes. But Thomas designed God in this man called Jesus. He says, my Lord and my God. Look at, look at, if you see in verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them, Jesus came. Jesus came. When you see the emphasis, Jesus, they're trying to emphasize the human side of him. Okay? So the human side, what they saw was the human side. But beyond that, Thomas encountered the divine side. And now he calls him, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, you have believed because you have seen. Now, this is what true faith is, beloved. This is what true faith is. Having not seen him, yet we believe. Can I hear an amen? amen. Having not seen him yet, we believe. Stop this behavior of uh, telling God, you know, you must do this, I see. And you say, even Gideon, you know, I want to do the Gideon thing. I want to do the Gideon, uh, uh, what is it? the Gideon test. I have to see you that can believe. That's a lower level of believing. It says, bless, there's a blessing that comes to you just because you believe and you have not seen. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 8, um, and I'll read from the ISV. ISV, this is what it says. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Having not seen him, yet we love him. That's faith. That's what? Faith. So blessed are those who have not seen 
and yet have believed. So beloved, stop looking for external and physical reasons to believe. Amen? Stop looking for those external things, but rather believe him on the basis of his word. Believe him. It is written, therefore I believe. It is written, therefore I believe. Believe him on the basis of what is written. You agree with me? Most of the times, we are tempted to look for some physical reasons. If God is with me, where am I going through this? Am I talking to someone here? That's what we feel, even now. I remember when COVID came, there was, uh, uh, when COVID hit the, 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 you know, the whole world, and there were talks, especially among those who profess the faith in Christ. You know, because I'm in Christ, it cannot get to me. If I'm a son of God, how can it get to me? And some of them refused to take precautions. Well, some of them were hit and they are no longer on earth with us today. And some of us who are here went through it and we marched and came out victorious. That doesn't change, isn't it? Doesn't change who he is. So we cannot afford to look for physical reasons to believe him. How can I be going through this and I'm a son of God? How can I be going through this and I'm a child of God? Why should I be? I want to tell you today, suffering is one of the means by which God matures his sons. Amen? I know that's, a, that's something we don't like hearing about suffering. And I think we should have a teaching on suffering one of these days. Because suffering is one of the means, one of the processes by which a son of God is matured. Which if a son of God avoids, then he, he gropes in immaturity for long. Are you together? One of the processes of maturation that every son of God has to be subjected to is suffering. Jesus set that example. So we have to believe before we see. An indelible personal experience with God is preceded by faith in his person and in his word. If God is going to make a, an impact in your life, if you're going to experience him in reality in your life, and he leaves an indelible mark in you that you can testify and others can testify that you have encountered God. That experience is preceded by faith in God and in his word. Amen? That's why you must believe what is written of him. Encounter that experience, that, that transformation is not preceded by external experience. It is preceded by faith in him. In rare occasions, does he come and meet you with an experience? And if you want to know how it works, you can ask Saul who became Paul. That's what you want. He's going to hit you, get you off the, off the donkey to the floor. He become blind for a number of days. And then he will send to you, uh, what is his brother's called? Ananias. That's what you want? Believe. Believe. So listen, brothers, listen. The conviction that God is, the conviction that God can, and the conviction that the Bible is the word of God is basic in the life of a son of God. Amen? The word, and I wanted to get this, beloved, the word is the primary means by which God speaks to us and reveals himself to us. Please write that down somewhere if you're writing. It's very important for you to capture that. The word the word is the primary means by which God speaks to us and reveals himself to us. He has revealed himself in the word. Okay? It is in the word that he reveals himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that God has concealed himself in the word and he reveals himself to us in the word. In the word, we find him, both the person, the human side, and the divine side of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. Isaiah 9, 6. It says, for unto us a child is born. Child, the human aspect. Unto us a son is given. Now, now, just at that point, I, I don't know that I have the... Okay. 
I want, I, want to, I want to highlight something here to us. Something I want us to see here. Unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. Now please notice that a child is born. This is a natural process. Isn't it? This is a natural process. This doesn't mean the child just shows up. It's a natural process. But notice the son is not born. The son is? Given. Child is? Son is given. For unto us a child is born. That the human side. And unto us a son is given. <coughs> that is the divine side. Then it goes on to say. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Not shoulders. Shoulder. Okay. And of course we do know. A shoulder is in the body and the church is the body of Christ. So the authority of the son, the government is upon his shoulder. The government of the son is in the church. Amen. We are the government of the son. Oh, glory to God. And his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I always tell people, when you pray and say Everlasting Father in the name of Jesus, it's just like saying Jesus in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus Christ, that is his name. Everlasting Father. You see it there? Everlasting Father. So unto us, a child is born, a son is given, the human and the divine. So let your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ be unwavering. Okay? Keep your confidence and trust in Him who is both our Lord and Savior irrespective of the tests, challenges, and temptations in life. Sufferings will come. We don't like that. It's the truth. Sufferings will come. And they come in different ways. They come in different aspects. Sufferings will come. Tests will come. Challenges will come. Temptations will come. But you have to make a choice to abide in Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen. Abide in Christ. You have to know him to abide in him. And that's why we have taken time to look at his divine side and human side so that we can together understand, get to know this Christ by revelation. Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39. Romans 8, 35 to 39. And it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, in all these things, because they will come. Because they will come. He said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Praise the Lord. Through him who? Do you know that, that Christ's love for us or, and God's love for us a settled matter. There's nothing we can do to make him love us. He has already loved us. It is settled. I am loved. These are, these are very basic things. We must build our faith around these realities in Christ. Amen. That I am loved. I don't need to give an offering to be loved. I don't take a fast to be loved. Amen. No. There's nothing I have to do. I need to do to be loved. I just need to accept him, believe him. And as long as I've accepted Christ, believe in him, I am loved. I am loved. Amen. Amen. This gives me a lot of rest. Hallelujah. A lot of rest. But yet, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, no things to come, no height, nor depth, 
nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing has the power to separate you from Christ except that which you allow. That's powerful. Nothing has the power. No one has the power to separate me. Please write this down. Nothing has the power to separate me from the love of Christ except that which I allow. Nothing. No one. No man, no woman, no devil can separate you from the love of Christ except that which you allow. And therefore, I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, do not allow anything. Do not allow anything. Any desire, any test, any challenge, or any person to separate you from your personal commitment and fellowship with Christ. It is a choice. Amen? To be and remain in Christ is a choice. Did you know even when you get distracted, it's a choice? It's a choice. Listen, if you want to know how strong you are, look at the choices you make. Your choices are dependent on your inner strength. If you break easily, it is because you have no inner strength. Choose to keep your eyes steadfast on him. Right? Remember we're talking about keeping the faith. We're talking about keeping our faith in Christ. Not being distracted from Christ. Choose to keep your eyes steadfast on him and to believe him to the end. Do not bow the pressure or tests and trials so that you draw back or betray the simplicity and purity of your faith in Jesus Christ. Do not. Desire to hold on and to endure to the end. Keep believing. Amen? Keep believing. Refuse to give up. Hold on there. Keep believing and endure to the end. Don't get into arguments that, are, that, are, that, are, that don't make sense. Don't get into arguments that, uh, you know, religious. There's a lot of argument going on. Is Jesus the son of God? You know? Is he really fully flesh, fully human brother, and fully God? Did Jesus say, I am God? Those arguments are there. I have no time for such. I choose to believe what he has revealed to me. Amen? Amen. Jesus himself began his life on earth with what? It is written. Amen? It is? He lived his life on earth with what? It is written. When he was finishing, he finished according to what is written. So Jesus lived his life according to the script. You and I, we have to live our lives according to the script. Glory to God. According to God's word. Hebrews 10, 39. I just, I just decided to take this session to encourage you to hold on. Amen. Strengthening the faith. Strengthening the faith. Hebrews 10, 39. It says, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. Hallelujah. Look at someone and tell them, I'm not of those who draw back. Some of you were of those who draw back, but that ends today. From now on, I'm not of those who draw back. I may have drawn back, but that ends today. Glory to God. I may have been weak, but it ends today. I may have failed, but it ends today. I am no longer in the company of those who draw back. I'm in the company of those who believe to the serving of the soul. Men and women who believe to the end. Amen. So always remember, always remember, when you find yourself in tests, when you find yourself in trials, when you find yourself in temptations, always remember, he understands you. He understands what you're going through. He knows the temptations. He knows the test. He knows the pressure. He knows the pain. He understands it all. Why? He has been there. Amen? So don't give up. He has been there. Let me tell you, there's nothing you have, you have gone through that Jesus did not face. 
He, he faced the same pressure, same tests from the same devil. He, there wasn't another devil to test Jesus and another one to test you. He's the same devil. Right? Who tested Jesus the same way? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But Jesus withstood. So you too, hang on there. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 16 to 18. And it reads, For indeed he does not give aid to angels. Now I read that one and I was so blessed. He does not give aid to angels. But he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? He gives aid to the seed of Abraham. You are the seed of Abraham. We are Abraham's seed. And he has committed to give aid to us. Therefore, in all things, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that's human, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Oh, praise the Lord. No wonder he has the audacity to say that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, because I've been there. He's been there. So he has that confidence to say that. He is able to aid you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. He is able to aid you. And as I share this, I pray that the Lord will release and minister strength to your spirit today. Amen. Amen. He's able to aid you. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. And by the way, some of you who find yourself broke and you begin to feel, how can I be broken? I'm a son of God. Please remember, Jesus at some point had not paid taxes. He was behind taxes. And things were hard and tough for him. You think he doesn't understand it? He does. He does. Some of you who think that uh, you have been betrayed by somebody, you lend somebody money, they refuse to pay you back. The treasurer of Jesus' ministries was a thief. <laughs> Judas himself. So what hasn't he gone through that you think you have gone through? Huh? He begins his ministry by telling the guys, please, you want to follow me? I have nowhere to lay my head. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. I have no house. I have no house. So don't, 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 don't tell us you are sleeping outside. You have no house. He had no house. He's been there. Can I hear an amen? Look at someone and tell him he has been where you are. He is able to aid you. Keep the faith. Hallelujah. Yeah. Sometimes you feel frustrated by your work. You wonder what's happening. I'm working too much. Maybe no fruit. Ask him. He was there. He worked in his father's workshop. You think that everything Joseph made was sold? There must have been some things made and they not, have no client. And there must have been times that maybe they have no clients. Even they have no orders. So he understands these things, beloved. Those of you children who are here, you think your parents are harsh, you think your parents are tough. Do you think it was easy for Jesus when Joseph and Mary came back for him from the temple? You think they taught him nicely? They asked, why have you troubled us? They're asking him. So Jesus understands what it means to be rebuked as a son, as a young boy. He was rebuked. Why have you troubled us? Maybe he was even spanked <laughs> by the mother. Yeah. He must have played out with other boys and he fell. Right? And maybe like the young boy who fell from the tree, my, my friend, Jesus could also have fallen from the tree on his own. We don't know. He has gone through the same pain. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's why he is able to aid you. Keep your faith in him. The one you believe in understands you because he has been through what you are going through. He is trustworthy. He is dependable. He is reliable. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sometimes I'm working too much. I'm so tired. Jesus slept in the boat. They were going for a mission. He's so tired. He sleeps in the boat. 
And, the, and, and then the, 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 the winds begin to blow. He's almost capsizing. He's sleeping. He's tired. Sometimes I feel so exhausted, so tired. I remember, oh yeah, he too was tired. So he can refresh me. He too was tired. So he can? He can refresh me. And refresh me. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a, high, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Amen. That confession, other versions say profession, that word confession of profession there is our confession of Jesus. Okay. The confession we have is a confession of Jesus. Let's hold on to what you confess that we believe in Jesus. Hold on that confession. You believe in Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But was in all points tempted as we are. Not in many points. Not in most of the points. But in all points. Was in all points tempted as we are. Yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Hold on to your confession. Hold on to your confession. On what is our confession? We believe in Jesus Christ. So irrespective of the heat and the pressure, keep your eyes and mind fixed on Christ. Amen. It is in him alone that you obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you move away from him, when you're distracted from him, it means then you have no access to mercy, you have no access to grace. But when you keep on, you know, keep on trusting and keep your faith in him, then irrespective of the pressure, you have access to mercy and access to grace. Can I hear an amen? But it's in him we access these things. Now, when you're under pressure, when you're tested, trials coming your way, temptations coming your way, pain and all these things, when you're in the heat, listen to this. In his infinite wisdom, I wanted to, I wanted to listen to this first. In his infinite wisdom, the Lord will either get you out of the heat or give you grace to go through the heat. Amen? He will either get you out of the heat or give you grace to go through the heat for a far greater purpose than you can see. If he takes you from the fire, it's for a purpose. If he gives you grace to go through it, it's for a purpose. And you cannot see the purpose at that particular time. Let me exhort us, beloved in the Lord. It is not upon us to dictate to him how he will help us. It is not upon you or I to dictate to him how he will aid us. That is his own prerogative. He can take you out or he can give you grace to go through. In whichever way that he chooses to deal with you, do not be distracted from him. Keep the faith. Psalm 23 verse 4. Psalm 23 verse 4. And it says, Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. For you are with me. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, but you're with me. The reason why I have no fear is because you are with me. Praise the Lord Jesus. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So he lets you go through. The greatest assurance is this. He is with you. So irrespective of how he chooses to handle you and your situation, if you dare trust him and believe in his wisdom, you will find rest. That's the most important thing. You will find rest. What does Job say? Job says in Job 13:15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13, 15. In, in Psalm 56, verse 3, David says, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in him. Glory to God. 
This is how to go through it in life. This is how to face the tests and trials in life. Keeping your faith intact in Christ. I beg you, don't try to become the architect of your own life. Don't try to find your way out. This is the way out. Trust him. Keep your faith in him. He knows what he is doing with you. Amen? He knows the best. He knows this one I need to take out. This one I have to let go through. This one I will allow to walk through. But as long as he is with me, whether in the fire or out of the fire, all I want is his presence with me. Praise the Lord. You are better in the fire with him than out of the fire without him. Oh, yes. Let Job tell him, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so keep your trust in Christ and do not be distracted and do not be derailed. Amen? Amen. Choose to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and keep believing to the end. I want to begin wrapping it up by giving us a question here. We have to stop relating with God with a mindset of terms and conditions apply. We have to stop relating with God with a mindset of terms and conditions apply. If he loves me, then he should do this. If he loves me, why isn't he doing this? That is now having the mindset of a businessman who does everything for self-preservation. Terms and conditions apply. That is bringing God to your level and using your standards to access God. Let God be God in your life. Can I hear me, man? Let God be God. Rise to his level. Amen? Amen? Rise to his level and quit scaling him down to your level. Hear me as I say this to you, beloved. <coughs> it is idolatry to use your needs and circumstances as the measuring rod of God's love and faithfulness and commitment to you. Can I say it again? Yes. It is idolatry it is idolatry to use your needs and circumstances as the measuring rod of God's love, faithfulness, and commitment to you. That is an idolatrous and religious mindset and it is bad manners. We can't use we cannot use our situation, circumstances, and our needs to measure God's love for us. I want to give an example. Out in the village, very deep in the village, there's a man who can't afford two meals in a day for, her, for his children. Am I right? Yeah. And the child will tell the father, because you have not given me lunch, you don't love me. Is that an abuse to the father or is that a, what do you call it now? What is wrong with that child? That's abusing the father, isn't it? Because he is using himself as the standard and his needs are the standard. That's what I'm saying, it's idolatry. Because when your needs and your circumstances become the measuring rod, then you become God. You become the one that you worship. You become the one who deserves to be worshipped because you have become the standard. That is something from which most, if not all of us, need to repent from. Something from which most of us need to turn away. Amen? We, we have brought God too low. We have got it's bad manners. It's bad manners. Because you have no house rent, then God doesn't love you. Because you have no job, then God doesn't love you. Because you have no husband, then God doesn't love you. Or because you got fired, you got sacked, then God doesn't love you. Because your friend got promoted, you don't get promoted, then God is not faithful. Then it means you are the standard that God should meet. 
For God to be God, he has to meet your standard. That's what you're simply saying. That's idolatry. Quit scaling God down to your level and you rise up to his level. Let God be God in your life. Trust in his infinite wisdom. Amen? Trust in his infinite wisdom. Let's turn away from this idolatry. And that's why people have no faith in Christ today. The, the slightest challenge, the slightest trial, the slightest temptation, we are knocked off our feet. There's a lot of idolatry. That's why when you get a new suit, it's a testimony to give on Sunday in church. God has blessed me. God is God. Last week, somebody just brought me a new suit. What the 7,500? God is God. So because God brought a suit, he is God. Oh, glory to God. Can you believe it, brothers? I got a promotion. God is God. With or without a promotion, he is God. He does not give you a promotion to prove he is God. Doesn't clothe you to prove he is God. Doesn't feed you to prove he is God. He feeds you. He clothes you. He promotes you because he loves you. Amen. And when he does not promote you, when he doesn't, when he doesn't get involved in some of those things, he has a reason you cannot understand. He still loves you. That must be settled in every child of God. Father loves me unconditionally. Father loves me unreservedly. Father loves me benevolently. Father loves me eternally. Praise the name of the living God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So stop trying, stop that bad manners immediately. Turn away from idolatry. Stop being your own God. Let God be God in your life. We make adjustments in our lives to fit God and his plan and not the vice versa. Amen? We make adjustments in our lives to fit God and to fit in his plans for us. Not vice versa. God does not adjust to fit your plan. When you hear the word of God, you adjust your life to fit in the word. These days, we even know how to quote the word. Does not the Bible say that he shall, if, if I, if he shall fulfill the desires of my heart? Then how come he's not doing this? Is it not written? Please give us the whole scripture. It is written, yes, but it begins by saying, delight yourself in the Lord. And he shall fulfill the desires of you. Because once he becomes your delight, then your desires are in harmony with his will. Those are the desires he is committed to fulfill. Amen? Delight yourself in your heart. I mean, in the Lord. Once you are in the Lord and delighting yourself in the Lord... Rejoicing in the Lord, increasing in the knowledge of the Lord, whatever you deserve from that position is consistent with his heart. He says, it shall be done for you. Oh, hallelujah. Because at that point, your desires are not selfish, they are not carnal, they are not earthly, they are not worldly, they are not sensual, they are heavenly. They are divine. They are connected to divine purpose. Glory to the Son of the living God. Listen, when environment controls our belief and faith in Christ, those circumstances and situations, eh? and needs, and sickness, and pain, and pressure. When environment controls our belief and faith in Christ, it is a sign of gross immaturity. When your circumstances, that's your environment, when your environment controls your belief and faith in Christ, it is a sign of gross immaturity. Jesus Christ has not yet become the object of your faith. That's why you use situations and circumstances to measure him. And the problem is, the problem is, this became the thing that has been preached in church for long. Yeah? So we tell you, God loves you. And he's going to give you a car. God loves you. He's going to give you this. So we grow up looking at God in the light of doing this and doing that and giving me this and giving me that. We must 
divorce ourselves from such a mindset. That's not the gospel. Amen? The gospel is centered on Christ. He has paid the full price. No greater thing can be done to prove he loves me than the price he already paid for my redemption. Praise the name of the living God. When Christ becomes the object of your faith, when Christ becomes the center of your life, no price is too big to pay in order to know him, to abide in him, and to serve him. No price is too big to pay. When, you, when, when he is your focus, he is the center, your eyes are on him, my friend, no price is too big to pay. Amen? No price. No price is too big to pay for you to know him, to abide in him, and to serve him. You will pay whatever price it takes you so that you can abide in him and you can serve him and increase in the knowledge of him and of his will. Do you know why we don't pay the sacrifice? We don't pay the price? He is not the object of our faith. Acts chapter 5, 7. You will allow me to just wrap this up today. Acts chapter 7. This is how Stephen endured stoning and then he slipped into eternity. Christ was the focus. May he become your focus. May he become the object of your faith. Look at Stephen. Look at Stephen. Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 60. But he that Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now Paul tells us that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But on this particular occasion, Jesus stood up and, 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 and uh, Stephen sees him standing up at the right hand of the Father. I want you to see that the position has not changed. He is at the right hand of the Father. But he stands. And said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. Now please observe here what is happening. Paul, I mean, no, no, Paul, Stephen is no longer conscious of this environment. Stephen now has transitioned from time to eternity. He has transitioned from man to Christ. Stephen has shifted his focus to Christ. His mind is in Christ. His eyes fixed on Christ. Now his focus is Christ. Hallelujah. At this particular time, all that Stephen is consumed by is Christ. I see him. This is how he looks like. I see him. My eyes can be holy. Oh, glory to God. I see him. Verse 58. And they cast out him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So this is how God works. This man is centered on, on his eyes on Christ. And God decides I will not take him out. I will let him go through it. But I'm with him in it. But as he goes through it, I have a target there of a young man called Saul. This Saul will not stone anybody, but he will be a witness. He will see what it means to die for Christ. So he is there. This is the same young man who, who became the Paul who wrote almost three quarters of the New Testament. Hallelujah. So when God strategically places you somewhere, don't take it for granted. Look at verse verse 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God. He has seen him. So he's talking to him. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And he had said, 
And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I wonder what you would have said. But let me tell you, if Stephen had not seen Jesus, he would have ran away. If Stephen had not seen Jesus, he would have cast this man on that particular day. He would have died cursing. But the man saw Jesus. The man fixed his eyes on Jesus. I want to say, I mean, I want to, say to you today, it takes a conscious and deliberate choice to believe and endure to the end. It takes a conscious and deliberate choice to believe and endure to the end. Stones will still come your way. Stones come in the form of words. Listen, listen. Though the environment was hostile to unimaginable extremes, Stephen was regulated from within, not from without. Oh, glory. Amen. He determined his environment and how to behave in that environment. He fixed his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. He ignored the pain. He ignored the people's wrath. And he not only forgave them, but he also interceded for their forgiveness. I'm telling you, the life a man lives when his eyes are fixed on Christ, the life a man lives when Christ becomes the object of his faith is a life indescribable with the language of man. You can't describe his life. No wonder Jesus said that he who believes is like the wind. Can you hear him? You see, you can't define, you can't explain him out. The man is stoned, but the man is praying, Lord, don't charge this against them. Apart from forgive them. Listen, in the midst of a hostile environment, Stephen chose to engage in his last transaction with God while on earth. He chose to maintain a Christ-like character and attitude to the last minute. That if Jesus came, that man may be redeemed, I pray for the redemption of these ones who are stoning me. What an attitude. This happened because the man kept his eyes on Christ. Irrespective of the environment, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. Write this down. To the extent you believe and know Jesus Christ, to that extent you have the power to control your environment. To the extent you believe and know Jesus Christ, to that extent you have the power to control your environment. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, very, that's powerful, isn't it? To the extent you believe and know Jesus Christ, to that extent, you have the power to control your environment. So you have no control over your environment if your inner eyes are not fixed on Jesus Christ. Your environment will control you. Amen? Your desires will control you. My needs will control me. My desires will control me. But when I lift my eyes to him and he becomes the object of my faith, oblivious of everything around me, oh yes, then that's when he begins to reveal his glory in me and through me. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Irrespective of the pressure, irrespective of the environment he is in. Some of us, when we are with very good friends, we, we don't know even how to behave like sons of God in the moment of excitement. What I'm talking about environment here, I'm not just talking about in time of pain or pressure or difficulties, even in times of pleasure and excitement and in those family meetings. Right? Even in those moments of pleasure and excitement. 
He says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Amazingly, in Hebrew, the word perfect and the word peace is the same, shalom, shalom. So it's double peace. You will keep him in perfect completeness, perfect peace. Whose mind, whose purpose, the word mind there is purpose, imagination, is concept, is work. The intellectual framework. Alright? The device for intellectual framework. When, when your concept, when your purpose, when, when your imagination is stayed on God, then he will keep you in perfect peace. Why? Because he trusts in him. When you put your trust in God, you walk in peace. Brothers and sisters, grow in him and learn to determine the state of your environment and not the other way around. Amen? Let's grow in him. Learn to keep your mindset on him and experience his shalom in the midst of hostility around you. That's how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through it. Amen? That's how Daniel went through it. That's how Peter, John, and James went through it. That's why how different men and women have gone through it in our day, keeping their eyes on Christ. Let Christ establish his government within you. And that government will determine your environment and how you operate in it. That I can be in an environment where everything is hostile, but I'm at peace. Amen? That's how Jesus operated. That he is in the boat, and there are storms beating, but he is sleeping in the storms. And like Thomas says, if you cannot sleep in the storms, you cannot speak to the storms. For you to have the power to speak to the storms, and they come down, then you have to have the ability to sleep in the storms. Mm -hmm. Because you have a government that is inside, that controls you. The, the, the government that is greater. You have an inner government. May the word of God become the government within you. Let Christ establish his reign, his government in you. This is what happened to Paul and Silas. In Acts 16, 23-25. In Acts 16, 23, 25. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, glory to God, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Not even the pain of the many strips or stripes, nor the darkness of the inner prison could distract this man from their God. How about it? They knew him. They believed him. And they endured to the very end. Even in the midst of much shame and pain, they endured through to the end. And in their lives and through their lives, Christ was glorified. I call you to keep the faith and you are to the end. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. I conclude, brothers and sisters, by saying these two things. Number one, Jesus Christ is both our beginning point and our finish point. He's our beginning point and our finish point. Amen? Yes. Let's keep our faith in him and our eyes fixed on him. We begin in him and we'll finish in him. He's the beginning and the finish point. Hebrews uh, 12 verse 1 and 2. Therefore we also see we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily enslaves us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. Some versions will say in verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Let's run with our eyes on him. Let's work with our eyes on him. Amen. Let's handle our parents and our children, our marriages and our jobs and our businesses with our eyes on him. I know people say, put one eye on God and one eye on your job. It's a lie. Put your eyes on him. Put your eyes on him and he will give you the wisdom to handle your job. Amen. Work with your eyes on him. Labor with your eyes on him. 
Mark it with your eyes on him. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. He is our beginning point and our finish point. Maintain your focus on him. Number two. Jesus Christ is our ultimate goal. Can I hear an amen? amen? Jesus Christ is our ultimate goal. We endeavor to be in him, to remain in him, and to be like him. Praise the Lord. Say, say with me. To be in him, to remain in him, to be like him. To be in him, to remain in him, to be like him. Come on, one more time. To be in Him, to remain in Him, to be like Him. That's our goal. That's our goal. That's what we are deeper. Whatever we are doing, it is because we have made up our minds. We want to be in Him, to remain in Him, and to be like Him. Amen. Romans eight twenty nine says. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So that he might be the first one among many. God's desire is for you and I to conform, to jointly be formed, to be similar to, to be fashioned like, to have the same form as Christ. So that you and I can become an exact representation of Christ. We make it our goal to be like him. In thought, in word, and in action. Amen? We make it our goal to be like him. In thought, in word, and in action. So whether we think in terms of moral and sexual purity. Whether we think in terms of financial and leadership integrity. Whether it is in terms of patience and endurance. Or whether we think about humility and obedience. Or whether we consider commitment and sacrifice or whether we think about consistency and productivity, whether we consider stewardship and management of time and resources, whether we think about pain and suffering, whether it is in betrayal and forgiveness, whether it is in diligence and excellence, in goodness and in faith, in whatever aspect of human life that you want to consider, Jesus Christ is the Father's perfect standard for you and I to emulate and attain to. Amen? We become like him in faith, in character, and in manner of life. And so desire, brothers and sisters, desire, make a choice, and pay the price to conform to God's pattern son, to be like him. Believe him and make a choice to remain in him. Make him your ultimate goal in life. Amen? Make him your ultimate goal in life. To be like him in thought, in word, and in action. To be like him in faith, in character, and in manner of life. Keep the faith and keep Jesus at the center of your life. I commend you to God and the words of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the sanctified. Amen. Amen.